Hello, welcome to our online service today. This is a, the second Sunday before Lent. It doesn't seem like it's two minutes ago that it was Christmas and Epiphany and already we're looking towards Lent. My name is Debbie Pau. I'm Associate Priest at St Mary's Chalcombe in St Stephen's Lansdowne. It's really lovely to be able to welcome you into my dining room again. Uh, as we come to have a bit of time with God and we worship together. This is an informal service, there is no liturgy, uh, just the readings and some prayers and my sermon from our physical services in our churches. Um, the readings are in the description below if that's helpful to you as is the opening prayer that I always love to use. I just love this prayer, uh, as you've probably guessed if you've watched our, these services before. Uh, I think it says everything as we come before God um, uh, and as we worship him. Let's take a moment just to pause and, and to pray. Prayer is written in, its, in the first person. Make it your own. <clears throat> it's you talking with God. I'm just speaking the words. Let's pause. Loving God, beloved one, let me be aware of you, with me and within me. Let me attend to each part of my body, all that's well, and all that's poorly. Help me to let go of all in my life that lies in shadow. What I've done, what I've said, what I've thought. All that's not helpful, that dishonours and mars your image in me. Have mercy on me. Let me trust your presence as I listen. Let me not be distracted by the clamour of every thought, but let my heart be still, my mind unlearned, my face unmasked. Let me not be afraid of all that I know I cannot be, but let me trust that I am enough, that to be here is enough, just as I am. And to trust that you look on me, my beloved, with eyes that see, with eyes that love, for you are love itself. Amen. <clears throat> Our first reading today <coughs> excuse me, comes from Paul's letter to the Colossians. It uh, begins in chapter 1 and at verse 15. Paul writes, he's talking about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created by him and for him. He himself is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that, that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God is with, was pleased to dwell. And through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things. <coughs> whether on the earth or in heaven. By making peace through the blood of his cross.
our gospel reading has a very similar theme. It comes from John's gospel, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. And uh, you'll be very familiar with this. We have this reading every year at Christmas. <clears throat> John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent back from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world. The world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, his own people and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh, but or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Now, I wonder if you've ever had one of those conversations with someone uh, where you've finished th thinking, um, wow, that was... Um, not what I was expecting. That was a bit bizarre. Well, I had one of those conversations the other day. I mean, maybe we have them all the time, but one that stuck in my mind. And I'd come back from something that was work related and I had my collar on. Uh, and I started talking to a lorry driver uh, on our farm. And I knew him a little bit, but not very well. He'd be in his uh, 60s and he'd lost a few friends uh, in the last few years. And he was finding that quite hard. So we had a conversation around life after death, faith, <clears throat> religion, all the things that I sort of thought were my territory. But he didn't like Christianity. And that's fine. Well, it's not really fine. Uh, because it generally means that there's some hurt somewhere. But it is fine because God never forces himself on anyone. And then we talked about life and the mystery of life. And he told me that he was convinced that humans came to Earth uh, from outer space in a spaceship, uh, perhaps a, a fetus, that grew on the spaceship and that landed on Earth and when it was fully developed uh, got out of the spaceship and inhabited Earth. And he thought about it uh, and he thought about the way that we as humans are quite thin-skinned, we're largely hairless, uh, we walk upright and we shouldn't really be able to do that. Um, and he also rationed that actually we're not so very far from being able to send spaceships to other parts of, of the universe um, and with people on board as well. So in his mind, uh, we, that was quite logical. And we talked respectfully, uh, um, but we left with our different views intact. And I had to admit to being rather surprised by the conversation. I thought that most people who didn't take a literal view of Genesis uh, were on board with evolution 
uh, even if they didn't believe in God as the life force and the creation behind that. But perhaps that is making assumptions. And as I've always been told, assumptions to assume makes an ass of you and me. And I guess, too, our faith can seem a bit strange. The Christian faith can seem a bit strange to those who don't hold it, too. Because the reality is there are many views out there of where we come from and the meaning of life, what's important, things we call our world views. When we talk to young people, they'll often talk about the universe uh, as somehow being in control uh, of life here and, and almost a prey to. They don't get God very often, but the universe they can relate to. We may think this is all a, a product of our current times, post-Christendom, that Christendom being that time when all the West uh, was Christian, at least nominally. But look around the world and each culture has its own faith with its own beliefs. It's nothing new too. <clears throat> Many of those faiths go back a long time. And it was certainly true around the time of Christ. John, who was a close friend of Jesus, he was part of his inner circle, um, and he was the author of John's Gospel, was thought to be living in Ephesus when he wrote his, his testimony about Jesus, the Gospel, his Gospel. And, and Ephesus at that time, it's in, uh, in land a little bit now, but it was right on the coast. Uh, it was a port, it was uh, a crossing place uh, of um, <clears throat> different cultures. Of, it was a trading centre for the region and, and that sort of crossing place, that mixing place of all sorts of different cultures and religions. Predominantly, of course, Roman and Greek uh, gods and, and myths being dominant. John had had such an amazing experience of living with Jesus, witnessing miracle after miracle happening around him. Then witnessing Jesus' death and his resurrection and experiencing the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost in a, a way he just was not expecting, as well as he had various other supernatural natural visions, the book of Revelation uh, being one, being just one. And somehow he knew, knew that there was something utterly different about Jesus, unique, special. And that's what he wants to convey in his testimony. Now, I have to confess to finding John's Gospel difficult. Uh, especially the prologue, the bit we've just read today. Some of you will absolutely love it. It will just mark the spot for you, the way that you think and, um, <clears throat> and, and read and, and what really speaks to you. And we are all different. I tend to be a bit science-y, maths-y. I like machines, I like cause and effect. I'm not a natural poet. Um, and John uses a lot of metaphor in his writing. Some people, a lot of people find John's writing really helpful. It can be quite, um, in some ways, quite simple. And yet his, his images are so profound and so deep. And over, over time, I've really come to appreciate God's, uh, John's gospel. But as I said, it's, it, I struggled to begin with. Luke's gospel I find much easier. Luke was a doctor. He meticulously records the events of Jesus' life. Uh, and, and I find that quite easy to follow. Matthew, uh, who was the tribe of Levi, he writes uh, very much for the, the Jewish people, relating uh, so much of what happens in Jesus' life to the Jewish scriptures. And uh, so John has been quite a creative thinker. Uh, he's a wordsmith, he's a theologian. He begins his book not with the, the uh, Jewish genealogy as Matthew does, not with 
the birth narrative as, as Luke does, nor with the beginning of Jesus' ministry as, as Mark, who's the action man, as he does. But he begins right at the beginning of time, the beginning of creation, at least, just as the book of Genesis does. Just as in Genesis, the first book of the Jewish scriptures, as Genesis takes a familiar, a sto stories that were familiar uh, in the ancient Near East at the time of Moses, who's thought to have written Genesis, um, just as it takes those creation stories and takes them and shows that God is in the middle of it, God is the creator rather than the wars between the gods, uh, <clears throat> that God is part, is God creates the, the uh, world and the universe and life. Just as, Math as, as Moses does that, so John shows us Jesus as at the beginning of creation, as the author of creation, as being with God and part of God. So what helped me with understanding this passage was realising that uh, the word that John talks about is in fact Jesus. You may think that's totally obvious, but I didn't get it. Not at first. And in Genesis, God speaks creation into being. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And we all know that words have power. I love you. I'm sorry. I hate you. You're fired. They're just a series of sound waves or squiggles on a page. And yet they have so much power over us and our lives for good, for healing and to destroy. So Jesus is the word, the creative life force that animates life. That force is in Jesus. It is Jesus, it is God. John wants us to grasp who Jesus is. Yet Jesus is also human. And that's what most people saw and heard. But by the time of John writing, Jesus had died. Most shameful criminal death on the cross. <clears throat> Jesus is actually referenced by Roman historian Josephus, who had no faith to promote, and he was referenced as a troublemaker. His reputation went far and wide. So how could a God, let alone the God, be part of a man who was so disgraced, infamous even? How could people believe in such a person as the light of the world. John holds all these tensions in his writing, introducing who Jesus is from the very start of his testimony, allowing Christ to reveal to us the God that we could otherwise not know, but also holding that, though through uh, and with Jesus, God created each one of us, many don't and won't recognise him, then as now. But John wants us to know through his writings just who Jesus is, and if we grasp that, it will influence the way that we think and the way that we act. But each one of us, in all our differences, is created by God in his image. It has huge ramifications for how we view people who are different to ourselves, who look different, who think differently, who act differently. With wars and tensions around the world escalating, tensions within our churches, within the Church of England. We need to remember 
We are all made in God's image, beautiful and precious. That we have a shared humanity, that we have something to learn from each other. And we can love each other, even in our differences. We have to remember that God with Jesus brought about the creation of this beautiful planet. In our awareness of the huge damage that we're causing to it, we need to include Jesus in the solution as we go forward, not just to rely on technology and our own understanding. We need to pray and to listen as well as to act. And we may be surprised where he leads us. John also wants us to know that belief in Jesus brings us to a very special place where we become children of God, a special and spiritual dimension, where we can come into an intimate relationship with God, our creator, God, our loving father and mother where we can know his unconditional love for ourselves. What a strange and wonderful God we have. Amen. So we come to our time of prayer. Let us pray to Christ, the image of the unseen God. Our God made us and our universe and delights in us. Prompted by the Spirit of God in us, let us pray. We pray for the godly wisdom that is touched by the beauty of creation, delights in the diversity of people and warms to the possibilities of cooperative prayer and work for the coming of the kingdom. We pray for the godly wisdom that in observing symptoms discerns causes and responds to the real needs. It strives not to control, but enable. Not to manipulate, but empower. Lord, we pray for those places around the world where power, uh, power destroys, where people aren't seen, as fellow humans, we pray for those war zones, praying particularly for your land, for Israel and Palestine, West Bank and Gaza, praying for Ukraine. And Russia. Pro Iraq and Iran. And America, for Yemen, and all the other countries in the world where there's conflict. Help us to see fellow humanity in the other. Pray for the godly wisdom that gives others both space and support, that encourages and guides, that knows when to speak and when to be silent. We pray for all those who are hurting. Pray for the godly wisdom that recognises the poverty of the rich and the wealth of the poor. That questions assumptions of worth 
and cherishes those whom the word world discards. Pray for the godly wisdom that sees time in the context of eternity, and death as the gateway of heaven, but recognising the pain of disease and illness and the desolation of grief. We pray for all who are ill and struggling at this time, those known to us and those known only unto God, and for all who are grieving. We pray for the godly wisdom that lives simply and thankfully, rejoicing in all that God is and does. Merciful Father, I accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We pray together as, with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. May the outrageous welcome of the Father accept us for who we are. May the incarnation of the Word touch us and hold us close. May the wandering of the Spirit help us risk ourselves in love. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and those you love and those with no one to love this day and always. Amen. May you have a blessed time until I see you again.